Hey everyone, this is a writing workshop that I'm hosting through Design Your Careers. So we'll talk a little bit about Design Your Careers. So DYC is a 501c3 nonprofit organization and a central platform that strives to showcase everyone's talents or skills by running various applied education and hands-on learning free workshops. So they try to show your skills and help you teach other people in various different ways. So for details, you can visit their website, www.designyourcareers.org. And you can check out their videos on their YouTube page as well. So you just go to youtube.com and search Design Your Careers and you will find all of their YouTube videos over there with different workshops and just about them in general. So their community is impacted in numbers. 50 plus designer career student leaders spread across the US. Two high schools now run a DYC club, six fundraising events to support community projects, 1,800 plus student learners learn new skills, and they're spread across four countries um, in US, India, Canada, and Australia. And 40 local and international adult volunteers volunteered through DYC. And 12 plus industry experts shared professional experience to learners through the DYC program. Now they impacted numbers and they served 3,000 underserved children globally. Now this is incredible and it's really great how they do it. You should want to join their community because they do help a lot of people. Now here is a small course introduction. So this is an introduction to writing. And here are the things you might need. A paper or a book, pencil and highlighter. If you really want to go all digital or like get into the new generation, you can try this on a Google Doc. Um, but it's gonna be hard to scratch things out and rewrite it like you would do as a real writer. And you'll basically be writing narratives and you'll be doing one sample project and maybe two if you really want to and you're very fast paced. So about myself, my name is Manuskriti Sista and I was a sixth grader at Sahamish Lawson Middle School and an upcoming seventh grader at Moss Middle School in Texas. I participated in several writing contests. Um, about a couple of years ago, I started when I got really into writing because it helps you let out your creativity in ways that you wouldn't normally let it out, like writing stories about anything. Maybe when you're on the beach or at home during the coronavirus pandemic, whatever it might be, you can let your creativity out through writing. Now here's a long course description which would be needed. So this is a short and engaging course intended to give students a general knowledge of detailed and interesting writing as well as a fact-based writing. So basically what we'll be doing is we will be writing narratives that could either be based on facts um, that have taken place already say maybe if you really want to you can write about your birthday party or maybe even if you're really into history maybe the american revolution which is based on facts but we'll be writing narratives these days so there are a couple of requirements which is the eligibility so students must be comfortable forming words and sentences so i mean you need to be able to express your creativity in general. So like, say you really are talking about ice cream, right? You really want to express how good it tastes or the flavor, or how you don't like it very much. You can not just say, I don't like it. So now lectures are meant for students to learn how to write detailed narratives that are either factually correct or imaginative fictional narratives. Technical requirements or students will need a computer to view videos that are posted on YouTube, which is common. Today is week one of our writing workshop and we will be doing narratives like I said before. And so let's get started. 
Hello, I'm Manas Kriti, and I'll be teaching you about narratives and a few ways on how to write them. I'll talk about the basic structure and how to form a detailed narrative and an intriguing narrative that draws your readers right into the story. So you don't want them to zone out in the middle or in the beginning or in the end. You want to keep them interested throughout the story, and this is exactly what I'll be helping you do. So here's what we'll do today. We'll talk about what narratives are the basic structure of a narrative, and then we'll have a Q&A where I'll answer, or we can call it a fact session. So I'll answer frequently asked questions about this. So we'll talk about what narratives are first. What are narratives, right? A narrative is basically a story or a tale that is an account of a series of related events, experiences, or occurrences, whether it's fictional or non-fictional. Fictional means that it's totally out of your imagination and it has nothing to do with real life characters or events. But while non-fictional is, it's completely based on facts and the event has taken place sometime or the other and may or may not have some real life characters. Personal narratives are the easiest to start with as it's what you face in your life, so it's relatable. We'll, I'll start with personal narratives by explaining what it is. You guys can go ahead and start with any other kind of narrative if you want it. So I'll be starting with personal narratives. What is a personal narrative anyway? A personal narrative is a story that a person writes based on an event, experience, or occurrence that they were a part of. It's something that the author experienced that made them feel an extreme way, whether it's happiness, sadness, scared, traumatized, or even anything else. You can have you can might have been surprised, you might have been very upset with what happened. It could be anything. So these would have taken any number of hours, days, minutes, or even years in real life. Flash personal narratives are tales of what would be the same thing, but would have been in over in less than an hour, maximum 30 minutes. So this would be maybe the time you fell down in the park and scraped your knee and you started crying for a little bit. So that would be a flash personal narrative. Whereas a regular personal narrative would have been some time in your life, like say that one week where you went to Disneyland, right? And you were so happy when all the rides, your cousins were there, your friends were there, you had the best time of your life. That would be more of a personal narrative. Now let's talk about the steps of narratives. So here is where everything gets a little bit complicated. You need to follow the steps in order to have a good narrative and not to miss anything that would be very important. Remember that you can't just start writing a narrative and expect it to be perfect on the very first try. Narratives take many steps to complete but turn out really good in the end. Authors take years and months of their time to write one book or even just a story. This is because they focus on each and every word and see if that's what they want to project in their story. For narratives, you usually start out by listing various feelings and then write down moments that you felt each of those. It's important to choose moments in which you felt those feelings very strongly because only then it'll make a very good, intriguing, and detailed narrative. So say you felt happy when you ate a candy bar. Now, you eat candy bars very often, unless your parents are a dentist and they don't allow you to. In which case, that would be a very good thing to write about. But in general, kids eat candy bars. Which means if you write about a time when you ate a candy bar, you felt that happiness a lot of times in your life. And it won't be as unique, and that won't be like the greatest thing that's ever happened to you, right? But say on your 10th birthday party, you got a hoverboard, right? Or you were able to see your favorite athlete play something. Well, that would be the best thing that's ever happened to you. You also have to make sure to remember this moment in your life for a moment really well, so that you can add extra detail and finesse to your writing. What are the steps of a narrative? Here are the six steps of a narrative as follows. I will elaborate on each one as we do the session for it. Gathering seed ideas, nurturing, drafting, revising, editing, and publishing. These are the six steps for a narrative.
Now I'll just be answering some frequently asked questions. So now a lot of people generally get confused between a non-fictional and an informative. So non-fictional narrative and an informative essay. So a non-fictional one is not completely based on facts, but you can have some characters that are not really true. So. It's kind of like historical fiction in a way, but you are the main character, so you don't have to have your exact name. But a non-fictional narrative is a narrative from your point of view in something that has happened that you were not a part of. So, say I'm a character in the 1776 American Revolution around that time, right? So I probably would be writing about the American Revolutionary War, and I'm not. I I definitely wasn't a real character back then because I was born in 2008. That was over a over 300 years ago before I was really born. So I'm not a real character, and I wasn't part of it. But say there was someone right with the name Richard who was fighting in the American Revolution. I could call myself Richard, and. Narrate the American Revolution from my point of view. So every battle that happened, we can maybe I can start at the Battle of at Lexington and Concord, or the Battle of, at Fort Ticonderoga, whatever place I want to start it, ending in the American Revolution. So this did not happen in months or days or minutes. It happened over years of time, right? Since the British conquered the U.S. and took it as a colony. Until where America got is an independence from Great Britain. Now this happened over years of time and it took lots of people to do it. Now I could ask like a reporter or a news person who is trying to get the scoop about it, or I could just be a soldier who's trying to fight the war. Right? Each of these are different points of view, and as a more experienced writer, what you can do is you can try to switch between things. So maybe Richard is a journalist, and then you have someone named George, right, who could possibly be a soldier fighting for the British side, or maybe you can be General Washington himself and write about what you're doing in your efforts to help the Americans. So an informational essay would be you taking the solid facts like George Washington. Fought specifically for so and so reasons. So and so people died, and this is exactly what happened. While a narrative is kind of the opposite in a way, where you're partially making up some facts, but some of the others are true. So this is the most frequently asked question, and then the other ones are like maybe. Do you have to revise your draft? What if you think it's perfect? Nothing is ever perfect. You have to revise it to make sure you catch all those little minute errors that could be anywhere in your writing. And the other ones aren't very important as this one is, so we'll stick to answering this question. That non-fictional narratives are not the same thing as informative na- essays. So this is all that I have for this week. I'll see you guys in week two or session two of narratives. They will be starting with the first step of the narrative writing process. So it's called gathering seed ideas. Seed ideas are basically the seed of your narrative, which is the growing plant or the tree. It's just like how you would tame your backyard, right? You plant a seed, which is your seed idea, and then slowly, as you nurture it, it grows bigger and bigger and becomes a wonderful tree, or in this case, a wonderful narrative. This is the first step. So hello. Today we'll be learning about the first step of the narrative writing process, and we'll also be practicing and gathering our idea for our story. So today's agenda: we'll talk about what gathering a seed idea is, ways to gather a seed idea, and we'll do it. And then more frequently asked questions about gathering seed ideas. So what is gathering seed ideas? This is the first and very most very important step of the process. Let's dive in and get to know what this is. So seed ideas are the basis on which you write your stories. You have to come up with a lot of these so that you can pick your favorite. Each of these seed ideas, you have to have a deep 
connection and meaning towards it and a strong feeling connected with each and every one of these seed ideas. One of these ideas will be the topic of your narrative. So it's important to choose deep topics. You can't choose that one time where you maybe just got gave a high five to your friend or got a high five from your friend or just made a new friend because you might have made millions of friends wherever you went, right? Uh, not millions, we'll say hundreds. So that isn't very special. But maybe that time where you met your best friend and first time you met them, immediately you knew that they were to become your best friend and you had no second thoughts about it. And maybe you had a long, interesting and deep and spiritual conversation with them. Maybe that's not what you're going to write about, but that's just an idea, right? And I put that elephant picture over there, not because it's kind of relevant towards gathering seed ideas, but because I'm trying to say that it could be about anything. Maybe you went to Africa and you experienced a safari, right? You saw elephants, lions, giraffes, all those African animals just grazing the meadow in their homeland, right? It could be about anything in the world that you've experienced or someone else's experience and you're writing in their shoes. Whatever it is, we're writing narratives. So how do we do this? So how to find some ideas. There are many different ways to pick a seed idea, but here's the way that I find most useful. Make a line across and down your page. You should now have four sections. So just in the middle of your page from both directions, make two lines. On the first section, make a happy face. Second section should be a sad face. Third should have anger and the fourth should have fear. Or you can change the fear one to a surprise, right? But anger, happiness, and sadness are the three most common feelings that people do feel. Now, next step for ideas. Now, since you've got all four sections, each with a different feeling, I want you to try to write down at least three moments in your life in each section. Three moments where you felt happy, three where you might have felt sad, three where you felt angry, and three where you felt fear or surprise, right? Or any other feeling that you might have written down where you felt it. Now, try to make sure that these are deep feelings rather than the shallow feelings that you've felt many, many times before. You now have four sessions with three events each. That is a total of 12 events. Although this is a writing class, in the first few weeks, math is important. Now pick one of these 12 or more ideas that you wrote. Pick the idea that stands out the most to you and will remember the most. So this will probably, but not definitely, be the topic of your story, right? So the last part of the first step of this process, the most important to start building on your story. Without this, you won't be able to write your story at all. Like you've written down so many ideas, but you don't know which one to pick which means that you won't have an idea for your story to go off of and thus ending up having nothing to write about. So now we have some frequently asked questions. Now gathering seed ideas is pretty straightforward and you might have a question about why you have to gather so many and it's because you want to pick the best possible one and not just pick some the first thing that comes to your mind because it isn't always the best. However, if it is, go right for it and pick it. Thank you and I'll see you guys next week. Hey everyone, now we're back with session three of the writing workshop, which is again gathering seed ideas, but this will be more of a homework session. So what's happening here? Here's what we're going. Here's what's going on. I would like all of you to spend just a little more time working on gathering seed ideas because it is really the basis of your writing, which means that it needs to be perfect before we get started with the rest of the process. I can have you just using 12 of your thoughts, especially ones that were a day ago. And maybe you come up with new things, you've experienced new things in the last day. So I want you, really, really want you to come up with more ideas. What do we do? So your homework is not impossible and it isn't very hard. We have three ideas in each of the emotions and all I want you to do is have a minimum of five ideas in each emotion and five total emotions. So let's say that you had happy, sad, angry, and scared as your emotions in class. I want you to add an extra emotion 
say maybe surprise or maybe if you had surprise add fear so for that emotion you need to think of another five ideas this might be a little bit overwhelming and you might not get it done all in a day you can take however long you want to come up with these ideas. The reason for having all these ideas is also very important. These ideas will give you so much to choose from. Remember, again, each of these ideas should be ideas that you remember a great deal about and can write a very detailed story. You don't want to pick your first birthday party because you probably won't remember anything. You should more likely pick your most recent birthday party because you should remember almost everything that happened there. So let's say your birthday was two days ago, right? And you have the best time of your life. Your mom gave you, you the new iPhone, your dad gave you an Apple Watch maybe, and your friend gave you a hoverboard. That would most likely be the best time of your life yet, right? Because it just happened two days ago and you haven't received anything so big yet. So maybe you would like to write about that. So this is your assignment. Have a minimum of five ideas for each emotion and have a total of five emotions. So this will mean a grand total of 25 topics or ideas. You should easily be able to think of 25 times that you felt each extreme emotion. So five times each. All five of your high ones could be your birthday parties and all five of the sad times could be where your parents got mad at you. But what I want is five ideas for each emotion and five total emotions. Now, I wouldn't suggest all five of your happy ones being your birthday because maybe you're, you're 11 years old and you remember your 11th birthday party, 10th and 9th. But it is very unlikely and highly not possible that you remember your 8th and 7th birthday party just as well as you remember your 11th one. And I wouldn't suggest that. Same thing with your sad ones. You don't want all of them to be when your parents yelled at you. Because one, that made your parents feel very bad. And two, you might have remembered that your parents yelled at you yesterday and the day before and the day before that. But would you really remember the time where your parents yelled at you five years ago? That wouldn't be very optimal. So... Try to think of something more creative and more out of the box rather than something very simple. And sorry about that, my kid. So what will be, we be doing next? Well, I shouldn't really be giving this away. It was kind of like a spoiler in, in front of a movie, but a lot of you might have already done writing in school before, so you should already know. Our next step is going to be drafting, but that is the only hint you're going to get. Thank you, and I'll see you guys next week in week four. Guys, today we're doing step four, I mean step two of the narrative writing process, which is called the nurturing. So here is where you will put your seed idea into a rough plan. So on to the next slide. So here's our schedule. We'll be talking about what nurturing is. I'll tell you what the dramatic arc is and show you a couple of pictures. And then I'll tell you what's included in the process of nurturing how we do it and then you'll be doing it and then i'll answer some frequently asked questions so what is nurturing nurturing literally means care for and encourage the growth and development of that's precisely what you'll be doing with your writing today so usually they say nurturing a baby which means you just take care of them until they grow up or nurturing a plant which means you take care of it until it becomes a tree and it's kind of ready to live on its own and then for your writing what it means is that you'll be writing and as it grows and gets better and bigger you'll keep uh, making it better and developing it so you will first rehearse your story that is basically verbally saying out how you want each part of your story to plan out. So you can start with the introduction, say. Um, you just say it out loud, like, my friends were coming over and I was really excited. Today's my 10th birthday and I can't wait for the party to get started. Something like that. And then you go on to the first body paragraph, which would essentially be the next part of the story. And so on until you finish verbally planning out your story. Then you'll be planning, which is basically writing down the plot outline of your story. There's a specific way that the plot line should go, and that's called a dramatic arc, where you have the climax on the top, which is the most dramatic part. Like, say you received your presents during your birthday party. The setting, exposition, or introduction on the bottom left, which is how it starts, the setting, the scene, and everything. 
And then we have the rising action, which leads up to the climax. And then the falling action, which leads to the solution. And then finally the solution, which is called the conclusion or the denou- denouement. So this is how a dramatic arc looks. There are multiple ways you can have it. And you can either have like the rising action and the falling action in equal amount of paragraphs or whatever. Or you can have more rising action and less falling action or less rising action and more falling action. Or you can have a retarding moment. So it's like it's coming down and then suddenly it goes up again. So you have another minor climax and then it falls down again which is again, a kind of falling action. That one isn't very commonly used though. So what does nurturing consist of? Like I already said, there are two things in nurturing. One is planning, that is your idea of your story of how you should plan it on a piece of paper or an online platform, which is your first draft. And the other one is rehearsing, which is verbally planning out the contents, distribution, details, and chapters or paragraphs for stories. So, when I say planning, I literally mean do your dramatic arc and then write down word by word your story, which is your first draft. I don't mean just do the dramatic arc and leave it because we'll be doing three drafts and each of those drafts is very important to make a very good final publishing piece. So how do you nurture? It should be one of the hardest parts of this process and So basically, you will be doing all of this, but you won't really have to talk with anyone. Verbally planning out your story, which you can do by yourself. You don't need anyone around, but it might be helpful to have your parent or sibling around to give you tips and pointers. Then you can come back and write your plan in the form of the dramatic arc and then do your first draft. So now there are not very many commonly asked questions about a dramatic arc or a nurturing process but the one most frequent question that i've gotten from many of my friends and people is the fact that why are there two climaxes in some plot lines well this is because either they start off with a minor climax that gives you a hint of what the major climax is going to be or the major climax And then rather than having a simple falling action, they want you to get more interested in the story so you don't leave in between and then give you the following action. Thank you. I'll see you in week five. Goodbye. So today we'll be doing step four of the narrative writing process, which is revising. Essentially, we'll be revising our first draft, which you should have done last class along with your dramatic arc. So here is our schedule. What is revising is what we'll talk about. We'll talk about why it is important. We'll do the revising. I'll talk about figurative speech and tell you what it is. And I'll tell you the importance of dialogue and then I'll answer some frequently asked questions. I may have a couple more for today. So what is revising? Revising is going over your writing, rereading it, and correcting any errors and mistakes you have. It just doesn't have to be small errors like spelling, which is not what you're going for right now. You're trying to make a whole plot change in a way. It can be something you want to add to make your writing better or something you want to remove, or even something you don't want to remove but don't want to keep as it is. It's the process of making a change after you've drafted. So, I'm not saying that, say you spelled milk as mickle, like M-I-K-L. I'm not telling you to change that now, because that's not going to change the outcome of your entire story. I'm saying, like, maybe the fact that you got a hoverboard for your birthday, but you actually confused it with, like, a ripstick or something, right? That will change the outcome of your birthday significantly. So I'm trying to tell you to change, like, some plot things, like maybe take out, like, a whole paragraph that you don't want and add a new paragraph in, or just take out a couple of sentences or add more sentences or change some sentences. I'm trying to tell you to do the big things rather than the small little things why is revising important when you revise you catch the errors that you wouldn't have caught when you wrote your story down if you don't catch these errors you could completely ruin your stories like i said these errors don't just have to be spelling or grammatical errors they can be indentation conveyance errors and many more revising helps you make your writing perfect 
So when I say conveyance errors, I don't mean like a conveyor belt, right? I mean like you're trying to get a point through, but it didn't come out exactly how you want it to. So you change a few words here and there and try to project your actual meaning. So revising, you'll be revising your introduction in today's class, obviously. You will be revising all your four paragraphs in today's class as well. So you will try to do as much as you can and the rest will obviously be homework. This will prepare you to draft your second draft next week. You will have all this for homework as well as time to do this in class today. Use your time wisely. And you need to have a minimum of three paragraphs, excluding the conclusion and introductions, but you are not limited to three. So you can do three or more paragraphs, but I want at least three, so it's actually a really good story rather than just something you spend like five minutes working on. So what is figurative speech, right? Figurative speech is the use of different phrases and sayings to make a point strong. There are four common types of figurative speech or figurative language. These are similes, metaphors, personification, hyperboles. There are obviously more and you can call them shampoo. S stands for simile, H stands for hyperbole, A stands for onomatopoeia. Pardon, I mean A stands for alliteration, M stands for metaphor, P stands for personification, O stands for onomatopoeia, and the other O stands for oxymoron. So I'll explain what everything is. So a simile is are the use of like and or as to compare two objects. Here's an example. My face was as red as a tomato. So your face is not exactly like bright red, but it just means that you're either embarrassed and your face turned slightly pink. A metaphor is a saying. Is saying something is another thing in order to compare the two. Here you do not use the words like or as. Her eyes were, as dar- were dark and deep pools of chocolate. Here you're referring to someone's brown eyes as deep pools of chocolate. So their eyes are not chocolate, obviously, but they're so dark and so brown and you're melting in them, right? So that's why you say that personification is giving an inanimate object, a non-living object, a human trait. Here's an example. The sun cried out to me to wake up. Crying out is an action that only humans can do. However, this trait is given to the sun, thus personifying the sun. It mean, it just means that the sun shone so brightly it woke you up. A hyperbole is exaggerating everything in order to make a strong point. You have various examples for it and try to come up with your own. While you try to come up with your own, here's an example. I ate a ton of cheeseburgers last night. A ton is literally 2,000 pounds. If you ate that much of anything, forget hamburgers, if you ate that much, you'd be in the hospital getting your stomach pumped. That just means you ate a lot of food. Now, if you literally go about eating a ton, like I said, you will be in the hospital for various reasons, maybe too much carb, sugar, whatever, right? You should not eat that much. But what they're trying to say is that they ate so much food that they're stuffed and they probably won't want to eat anything else. Now, I'll explain what the other things are. So we went through similes. Next we have H, which is a hyperbole. And then we have A, which is an alliteration. So um, it's basically a sentence or a paragraph, if you can actually do that, that all the words start with the same letter, except maybe like the minor words, like and the, those kind of things, except those, everything else starts with a letter that's common. So I'll do one for, I'll do an alliteration for A, right? An angry alligator ate an oxalotl, oxalotl, right? An oxalotl is this kind of fish kind of thing, but I'm not sure why an alligator would be angry or why would he an, an ox, oxalotl, but it's an alliteration and it doesn't really have to make sense all the time. Next, we have metaphors, which we covered, and then we covered personification. Now we have an onomatopoeia. Pardon, I mean onomatopoeia. So an onomatopoeia is just using a word for what it would sound like. So when s- it's usually used in comic books or graphic novels, as some people like to be specific. 
So like when something blows up, right? Generally you would have a boom over there. That's literally what an onomatopoeia is. Next we have oxymorons. So it's like when you have two older sisters, right? But you have one younger older sister and the older older sister. So an, a younger older sister is an oxymoron, is an oxymoron, I'm sorry, because you have younger, which is the opposite of older, right? And then we can do the same thing the other way. You have two younger sisters or two younger brothers, and then you have the younger, younger brother, and then you have the older, younger brother, right? But both of them are younger than you. It's just that one of them is older than the other. That is a, an oxymoron where you have two opposite or contradicting words in the same sentence. In a way, it makes sense, but if you just think about it without using logic, it will not make sense. Next, we'll talk about dialogue. Dialogue is one of the most important things when writing a narrative. It shows the conversation between two or more people. Generally, using dialogue instead of describing the scene makes the writing more intriguing. You want the reader longing for more conversation between the characters. Narrative writing is basically just exaggerating a small moment that took place. I want you to have a good amount of dialogue in each paragraph and highlight your dialogue in blue. Now, you cannot have a narrative without dialogue. It's not possible. It'll be very boring and boring is not good for readers. Now, you can have a narrative that is only dialogue. Absolutely nothing but dialogue. And that is perfectly fine. It's actually more interesting that way. For some people, but I like a good balance of dialogue and narr narration. Okay, so here are some frequently asked questions. Why do we revise, right? And what is the use of figurative speech? So I'll go from why do we revise. You want to revise because your writing is not perfect the first time. And if you have to draft three times, you cannot repeat the same thing over and over because you're not drafting three times then. We just copy and pasting exactly what you wrote two days ago. Now, why do you have to use figurative speech? So if I say my face was really red, right? That gets the point across. But when you say my face was as red as a tomato, you're giving them something else to consider. So you're like, my face was red, but how red was it? You're giving them some detail and something to go off of. So that, that is all for today's class. I will see you in week six, where we'll be drafting again. Today in drafting session six, we will be doing the most important thing. Like I already said, drafting. Hello, today we'll be doing the next step of the narrating writing process. And I think this is the fifth step, if I'm correct. So here's today's ad agenda. We'll talk about what drafting is, why it's so important, and then I'll answer some frequently asked questions back. So what is drafting? Drafting is the most important process of the narrative writing process. Drafting is the process of writing your story in steps. You will not have only one draft, but three drafts. You will publish your third or maybe even fourth draft. Your first draft will not be f perfect. You will fix it, do a second draft, fix that, and make your third and last draft and publish that one. If you don't like your third and dra last draft very much and you feel like you can make a couple of more changes, you can go and write for it and do a fourth draft. Why is it so important? Drafting allows us to improve our writing over days and times. Something you may have not noticed today, but notice tomorrow might pop up and you can correct it in your current draft. It will allow you to perfect your writing. Drafting also helps in peer editing. This allows you not to get worried about how you'll finish your writing with other people's writing on your work. It will make sure that you make changes and perfect your work in your own way. So peer editing is when you hand your work over to a friend, family member, or someone who's not you, and have them, most, most likely your friend, because then they're in the same age group as you, and you'll have them edit your work. So you may feel like your work is perfect, but they may find something that they don't necessarily like in your writing, and they will tell you that. And based on that, you can fix your writing. Okay. So now I'll answer some frequently asked questions. So a lot of people ask, why do you need so many drafts, right? Why can't you just perfect your writing in the first 
draft. This is simply not possible. You can be so perfect that your writing appeals to you in the first time you write it. You need to revise it first and then use the revisions that you necessarily like and take the ones that you don't necessarily like and then use the ones you like in your second draft. Now, I said that you can add edits while you're drafting. This is because you may have found some revisions before when you did the revising part. But now you may find something else that you did not see before, which you have to add. So you can add edits while you're drafting, but it is not compulsory or mandatory. And it is helpful though, that's all I'm going to say. This is it for this week. You will be revising again in week seven and then drafting again in week eight. So you should already be able to do that. You can go back and refer to week five session, that same slides for week seven and refer to this again for week eight. I'll be directly showing you week nine slides right after this so that once you finish your revising again and drafting again, we can jump on to the next step. Hey guys, we're back for session nine, which is editing. What is editing? Editing is making the small changes in your writing that can make a huge difference. Editing requires you to have utmost concentration and focus on each and every word of every sentence and every paragraph of your writing. You don't want to miss any word because it might be misspelled, it might be in the wrong place, which makes it grammatically incorrect. You want to focus on every single letter of every single word of every single sentence of every single paragraph in your writing. And if you have chapters, every single chapter. I cannot stress how important this is. Editing is not making huge changes in your writing. It is making the tiny errors that you would not do in revising, like grammatical errors and spelling errors. What do you do when editing? In editing, you have to correct only the small errors like spelling or grammar. The major errors, such as changing the entire plot of your story, should have been made in the two revising sessions that we had. You also had time during your drafting session to do this. Example of editing. I want to call it milk A. So want is spelled with two A's, chocolate is spelled with two O's, and milk has an extra E. Correction of the example. I want chocolate milk. Notice how that didn't change the entire plot, but just corrected spelling errors. Changing the entire plot would kind of be like, I want strawberry donuts. Donuts has nothing to do with milk. Chocolate has nothing to do with strawberry. Example two of editing. Chocolate milk want I. Correction of the example. I want chocolate milk. Here, the sentence is grammatically incorrect and I didn't change anything except the grammar errors. The plot stayed the same. I did not go, I want mango ice cream, right? It still stayed milk. It still stays chocolate. It just switched the grammar up to make it correct. So that's it for today's session. It was very short. Use these slides to help you with your homework, which is basically editing. Thank you. See you next week for our final session that is publishing. So guys, this is our last session of our writing workshop. And it's session 10, publishing. And this is was a 10-week workshop that I put into this one video. Hello, today's your last session and we'll be publishing our writing. Publishing means for us non-professional writers, unprofessional writers, to read our work, out our work and share it with people. So you can do this at home, you can do it with your friends, you can do it anywhere you'd like to. But you want to share your work with people so you get their feedback, you understand how you wrote it and when you read it out loud you get a different feedback from yourself rather than when you write it down when you write it and read it in your mind you will feel like everything's perfect and there was nothing you could possibly have done to change it but when you read it out loud you start to think maybe this should have been different or maybe i should have added more dialogue here so you will get all these realizations it was so much fun teaching all of you, and I loved it. All of you are so enthusiastic about learning, and it was a pleasure teaching you. Thank you. I'll be hoping that you guys join some of DYC's other workshops. They host so many 
starting any week that you would possibly think of. You guys should join more of their workshops. You may see me on there some other time. Thank you for joining this workshop. Thank you for watching. For details, visit www.designyourcareers.org or send an email to info at designyourcareers.org. Subscribe to our channel, Design Your Careers, and hit the bell icon so you'll never miss a video.